Everybody, you're watching the Letterman podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah. <laughs> la, 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 la. Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. This is a special episode because it has two intros. It does. I'm shooting this really quick one. Uh, hopefully, it'll be really quick. Um, people who have watched the show are going to be like, yeah, right, Mike. Um, but I am. I'm shooting this intro here. Uh, the intro to the intro of the Rupert G. Irene Hoffman episode. Um, very, very excited. Uh, I basically just started... Um, a call with them and had the record button going, not knowing what was going to happen. What ended up happening uh, was a very, very nice episode of the Letterman podcast where it's three friends just talking, but um, we're, we're talking with a purpose and we're, and, uh, you know, I asked a lot of questions to Rupert. Rupert went into a whole bunch of cool insights and stories. Um, and then it's cool hearing Irene's perspective on them as well. And she talked about some of the uh, times that she had visited the show as well and 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 had responded back to the David Kay episode because um, a lot of pieces uh, of the puzzle were um, were certainly revealed when we had David on the show. So it was a very cool thing. I love it. Uh, before we get to the show, the reason that I'm shooting the second intro um, is because we want to uh, thank very, very much the uh, the gal who was on our Christmas episode, Marilyn Sargent, sent us one of the hymnals uh, that was read out that night that Dave had at the desk. Um, very cool. Thank you so much for this. But this gift kept on giving because um, she included with this, <laughs> um, there's snow from the final Christmas episode of... The Late Show with David Letterman uh, afterwards, after she had her poem read and all of that, had a great night. She waited around afterwards and she collected some of the snow. She sent that to me with the uh, with the joke, actual asbestos from the final Christmas show. Uh, really delighted about that. And we're going to also shout out Glenn Borders. Um who was in charge of the fake snow and, and had to make that happen in that theater that night. And it was a, a whimsical, magical experience. So I want to say thank you to Marilyn Sargent. Really appreciate you, your support of the show. Uh, this has just been so much fun. We're having a blast, a blast. I tell you doing this show here, I'm going to finish this intro because you're about to go into another intro. Uh, but it's real time though, because um, very little was actually trimmed out of this episode. Um, just a couple little continuity things were just, um, uh, you know, for, for to, uh, to simplify things. Uh, but other than that, Rupert goes deep in talking about some of the behind the scenes of the Fun with Rupert segments. Um, specifically, we talk about uh, the restaurant scene. Um, there's some insights there that are very cool. And I will tell you this, he tells a story that I do not believe has ever been told uh, about one of their trips to California with the Fun with Rupert segment. It is, holy cow, uh, you talk about some Monday morning quarterbacking, Monday morning quarterbacking, what that could have been like. Um, I'm going to let this intro go. And without further ado, uh, the Letterman Podcast is proud to present my conversation with my friends, Rupert G. and Irene Hoffman. Enjoy. All right. Welcome to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. Uh, I am starting an episode, maybe? This might be an episode. It might not be. Uh, my friends are about to jump on the call here with us. It is uh, uh, my friends and your friends. Rupert G. and Irene Hoffman are about to join. Uh, Rupert is taking a well-deserved vacation from his time in New York, uh, running the day-to-day -day operations of the Hello Deli, and he is down hanging out with Irene, and they are about to jump on the call here. I'm very excited about that, and we will, uh, um, uh, he's got a story that he's going to tell, hopefully. Uh, this is all real time. See, we don't prep things mm -hmm. here, and that's very, oops, that's very obvious, I think. Um, if, you have, uh, uh, if you're a regular viewer of the Letterman podcast, you see that we sometimes fly by the seat of our pants, and that is what we are doing right now. Um, but there's a story that I'm hoping that Rupert will tell. We have gotten the clearances from the powers on high that it's okay that he tells this story. Um, one thing I love about Rupert is how protective he's. Uh, there's two things about Rupert. He's fiercely grateful uh, for Dave and company. 
Um, you know, I mean, obviously he became friends and family, family to this crew and these uh, people who worked for, for Dave for so long, but also Dave himself. Um, he, he will, ne you know, Rupert has said to me, he'll never be able to repay the kindness um, and the gratitude that he feels for Dave. Um, the second thing is how fiercely protective um, not just Rupert, but everybody is of 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 Dave. I love that. I think that's probably come out so far as the uh, Letterman podcast has um, uh, has has exhibited so far. Most people that we've had on very protective and respectful of Dave, of the institution, all of that stuff. Um, and so Rupert told me a story privately, and I was just like, like gobsmacked. For those who are listening to the audio, I just kind of sat there with my mouth open agape. Um, and and uh, is my mouth open agape or is it just agape? I think it's probably just agape as opposed to a grape, which is something else entirely. Um, anyway, he tells me this story and I'm just like, holy crap, uh, that's amazing. And um, he was like, yeah. And I'm like, we need to tell this on the podcast. And he goes, well... I don't know if I'd ever want to tell that story uh, without the permission of, uh, uh, oh, and look who's here. Let us admit into the Letterman podcast. Where are, let's see. Let's see. Here we are. All right. Yeah. Okay. But I need to How know. Uh, he says, how you doing? Yeah, fine, good, excellent. I need, I need to know what are you seeing in the back? Because I'm trying to conceal every mess that I've got. I see nothing, but that's uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can. Well, wait, the background is, wait, the background is nice. I, I, I'm certain it is. I'm certain it is. I asked you, I just asked you to start video. So you need to start video. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh, hey guys! Hey, hey Mike! Holy you crap! You got purple hair. You got to make oh, me me <laughs> me, which I shouldn't have. It's brunette. There's no, there's zero color in my. Why am I purple haired? I, I'm brunette. It's color. Uh, no, maybe a filter. You got to. Oh my god! You've got a filter on, making it look like you have purple hair. How do I take the filter off? I don't know, but I don't think we should do it. I think we should just go with it. All right, will you tell everybody my hair is not purple, really? Hey, everybody, Irene's hair is not purple. Oh, God, don't tell me we're on. <laughs> Are we on? I can we're edit on. whatever. I can, I'm, I'm starting to get that's it right. edited. That's, oh. that's a beauty of editing. Yeah, yeah and, I and, can you, edit. and actually, I've seen some of your editing, and it's really good. I mean, oh, it's the, coming. I, no, I love the way you... I just love it. It's a it's a great little. All right, okay. Now what do you, think you of the know. Set? What do you think of the set? I love it. I love it. I've it's been coming. seeing. I've been seeing it frequently when you're on Jay's show and they flash to you yeah. or you split screen. <laughs> I soak it up every single time. This one. Well, you had the set on for a couple of interviews already, right? Yeah, he's yeah, it's, yeah. We're still uh, we're still updating. So so back here, there's gonna be a skyline, probably like stainless steel with uh, with LED lights in it. So there'll be a, a building skyline, and then I'm going to actually put a window case in front of it. So wow. on this so on this wall, there'll be the window case, and if we wanna. Well, wait, wait, we wait. We've got throw wait, some pencils wait, or whatever we can. Wait, we've got to help the youngster out when you say window pane, as in the set of the late show, because I guarantee you, he's not gonna connect the two. Okay. When yeah. you say I'm gonna put the window pane up, he's yep. gonna go, wow, oh cool, a window pane does won't connect the two. No. No, okay. but that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. If it's in, yeah. if it's an inside, it's inside, and the people who will know will know. Well, I will say this. Getting him to do this has been a I don't want to use the trite expression because I'm trying to I'm trying to get you and me because I've got to apologize for grammatical errors. Oh, plenty. Oh, Mis oh my God. Mistakes. Oh, plenty. But um, I don't want to use the trite expression about pulling teeth because everybody knows that one. 
um, just give me an image of tug of war or <laughs> gee, that kind of thing. And, and it takes it takes at least from 30 to 45 minutes before I can finally get him to go. OK, but he said <laughs> not talking about me. Yes. Oh. <laughs> he said not in a million years would I be able to do a podcast? I don't have that much in me to say. I cannot talk for that duration. And I'm going, you gotta be kidding me. But anyway, that you named the excuse, here we go. Up here, <laughs> and then, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got this, this over here too. So- Okay, but I, I gotta say this though. I mean, that's the appeal. Like his, his, your Rupert, your segment that I watched film on the outside, like a puppy dog looking in the window, yeah. you know, that was segment awesome. was so good. It came off so good. But was, part of that has to be the fact that there's somewhere inside of you that thinks it's not yeah. turning out well. Yeah. Uh, that's got to be part of the secret sauce to why yeah. Rupert's so popular. And that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm it, cool. it's but like before, we, hold on, before we get to that, Irene, how happy is your dog right now? He's extremely happy, but we took. <laughs> He's um, daddy. He's, daddy, he's he was on daddy's lap just before you started. I, I know I saw I've I've watched it. I've watched it. Okay. Oh, you got to see it? Okay, yeah. but the noise from you is like I don't know what they're doing. So yeah. he he's I get that a lot. Lo small animals will uh shriek and run away from the sound of my voice. I get that a lot. He okay. he went into his crate just now for <laughs> safety. He'll come back out. Say, 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 come on, come on. The abrasion yeah. of Chisholm's voice sends small cute <laughs> animals flying through the air. No, it's <laughs> it's anything out of the norm. Mother me is so rudimentary schedule. You know, everything's yeah. just his element. And then if anything's out of his element other than daddy, <laughs> it's like you know but i did I, I don't know if we're recording but and you can edit i am but, but i can I, edit don't don't worry about what that. i thought because i've been itching to tell it was at least the tease up to the point where i didn't have to go to the stage door anymore yeah just yeah. to watch Zsa, Zsa gabor paul newman uh glenn close um uh, uh, barry white you name them and we've got photographs we've got photographs of them coming out but that was my whole late show experience for two years i i, I um before okay i want to get to the, like we'll get to that in one second but we're going to put a pin in something here remind me to tell you the story uh that robert morton and i have been going back and forth about jaja gabor remind me to tell you that okay, okay. so morty and i've I been saw... going back and forth quite a bit I and, saw her uh, a couple anyway. of times outside that stage door. So she wasn't an infrequent guest if for me for two years, but we were going up, you know, four or five, maybe six times a year. But yeah. for me, for us, to, for me to haul my family at five o'clock <laughs> to those um, sawhorses and for me to have seen her twice in those in that span, she was not an infrequent guest like Tony Randall was not infrequent did you okay, ever see tony I, randall i love him yeah i love him too uh he i, I, I want to do on. some sort of a tribute to him on here because i mean he was on the late show so many times did you ever see him irene oh no no i never saw him but um i caught a bit with him he, i was gonna say you you probably saw him quite a bit rupert now i what he was doing by the time i was in the theater he was doing bits with um Helen Hunt, yeah. she was she was planted a few rows back from us because we were in the front. Um, he was doing bits with Tom Selleck. Never saw a more stunning man in my life. Stunning or a more stunning mustache. That mustache, uh, you could uh, you could print film on that mustache. That thing is. And amazing. we're talking 1990 because I started getting to go with my 16 tickets. I started getting to go in 1995. 93, yeah. 94, we were just stage door people or just hanging around. And that's when Dave was running out to do a remote. You yeah. know, he was supposed to run out of the theater and he bumped right into my husband and he said, oh, excuse me, how you doing? Uh, hey, how you doing? And my my husband is, I took him to Hollywood uh, two times, three times. My husband didn't care. 
cared this much about celebrities. <laughs> yeah. But he was cool with Dave. He goes, fine, Dave, how are you doing? And then Dave ran back into the theater. Um, <laughs> okay, I think it would be a great tease to go to start with my dream never thinking ever being realized. And then two years worth of, come on, it's five o'clock. We got to get, you know, it's almost five. We got to get to the theater. What are we doing again? Just come with me, come on. And it was freezing cold most of the time we were frozen. Now, I think Walter's request should be granted first. And then you should take the purple off my air. Okay. <laughs> hey, the purple's on your end. That's a filter on your end. I, I can't I can't do Ooh. anything about it, but I think it looks Ooh. adorable anyway. Ooh. Um, okay. Rupert, are you willing to tell the story about uh, in LA? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a quick story. It, so it's okay. easy. So your guys, uh, how many times did you travel to do the gig where you had the glasses and the hat and the disguise and you were being, yeah, you know, Dave's parent? How many times did you travel to do it? Um, I think three or four times. Uh, we did one in, we did one in LA. Uh, LA. Yeah. One in San Francisco. Francisco. And then yeah. one in Miami. And Puerto Rico. No, no, no. They've never shot in Puerto Rico. Um, oh, wow. Okay, so when you went to San Francisco, did you meet Manny the Hippie? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, I heard about him. I, I did not yeah. get to meet him, but they had me on standby for a couple of days because finally, you know, they found a sensation. Yeah. And so they were busy shooting with him. So I had to hang around for an additional two days before they we started doing you know, the fun of Rupert thing. That was, that was the high wire act with those remotes because those remotes, they didn't necessarily know what they were going to find, right. but then right. every once in a while they would fall into like, yeah, they'll they would fall into jazz. Manny the hippie. And it's like, oh, this guy, we got something here. And then they started oh, yeah. expanding it and doing things with it. A absolutely. And I, and I already knew that this kid was going to be an instant star right after that. Oh yeah. Swag. Um, yeah. That, that, so, okay. So you did it in San Francisco too. Um, yeah. But the LA one, uh -huh. um, which is which is crazy. That was that was the Michael Jordan. That was where the Michael Jordan thing happened, right? And it was the that's a crazy story too. Like that is that's yeah. Bonkers. I, I told Walter that story already. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. But uh, that's the same trip we're talking about here, though, with this other story, right? You, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know if I shot in Los Angeles twice. It might have okay. been just one okay. time. If it was only one time, then it was with with the my. Yeah, Michael Jordan too. Yeah. <laughs> that was, Michael Jordan. That was crazy. And the way Walter edited that, uh -huh. uh, when they told the story, the backstory about oh, that guy, no, and then they yeah. said what he did, and then clip not available. Not uh, no. yeah. Genius. Well, there was a picture of him, you know, dead in a shootout in, in the Atlantic. I think it was called the Atlantic, and and yeah, Atlantic the, Monthly. I think is the name of the magazine. Atlantic Journal. Something. Atlantic Journal. But he said they shot. And it was also on television as well. But was... but I didn't ask Rupert. Was it the FBI, the feds, who killed him, or was it his own no, people? No, it was a shootout against uh, with his own or, people. Uh, yeah, well, that's his people. For those who don't know what we're talking about, go, uh, obviously not until you're, we're done this, whatever it is that we're doing here, uh, go to watch on the official channel, uh, Rupert's fun, uh, favorite moments segment. And there's a very cool little sub story that happened one of the times where Rupert was in LA yeah. um, that, you know, again, you can't write this stuff. It's just one of those things. Um, but I remember, I remember being, you know, back in the, in the, in the nineties watching and when you looked over and saw this big, big fat white guy, Hey, it's my, wearing a Michael Jordan, a Chicago yeah, Bulls jersey. Right. Hey, it's Michael yeah. Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. And I was told the guy usually carries a gun in, that, in his backpack. And well, you could see that. So thank God he didn't use me as target practice. Yeah. You can see the strap. You can see the strap and a little bit of the pouch. And then it said, reportedly, uh, he carries a gun in that pouch. Yeah. It, it's crazy. He seems so harmless. Yeah, he know? seemed but, harmless. He was the killer. Well, that and, was the thing that, about you in that getup, though. You you seemed harmless. Yeah. Like, you didn't seem like, yeah. you know, I, and I understand that, you know, there were some, uh, there were some hijinks that happened and okay. Uh, right. But, but you did seem harmless when you were in that getup, you know, you seemed almost simple. Like you're just a simple man. Like, yeah. uh, well, you know, I, and I, I think I looked like a wacko. 
yeah. But, <laughs> but 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 a, but a harmless wacko though, harmless like wacko. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Not like intimidating wacko. Yes, but he kept speaking in Spanish, and I don't. I know it's probably something very simple, and maybe they translated it, but I didn't understand what he was saying to Rupert. Oh, he's just something like, don't bother me. I know, but El, El, El Diado, something like that, the word. They added, because you have you have closed captioning and other, and Dave's channel, I believe, has closed captioning. Sure. And I don't I think you can turn watch, it on with YouTube, I think. Well, I don't watch anything without closed captioning because I can't miss a syllable. You know, if yeah. I do, if I do, I rewind it and 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 see it again. And he kept telling Rupert several times. I heard it twice, two, two, three times, where he said something to Rupert about like, you know, uh, get. I don't. It didn't sound like get away from me. It sounded like, you know, I don't know what it. I don't know what it meant. Anyway, <laughs> that dog is so happy. Rupert's in town. I can't even. <laughs> Yeah, he's not my dog anymore. I, he'll he'll listen to me call him, but then he kind of looks over at Rupert and says, "Should I pay attention to her or not?" So the yeah, alpha is her. here. Um, <laughs> so okay, down in L.A., uh, Rupert told me a story at dinner uh, when we when we were in New York. When my wife and I were in New York, uh, Rupert told me a story at dinner that just it gobsmacked me. And I, to my knowledge. It hasn't ever been uh, unearthed, um, and we actually made sure with uh, with the pants crew that it was okay that this came out, and, and it's fine. In fact, um, one of them said, hey, I can't wait to hear this story come out. You, down in L.A., you're in the van doing your thing. Um, I don't know if you're in the same van with Dave or not. This is the stuff I want to ask. Uh -huh. You run into or you see Jay Leno's crew out there while you're doing your thing in the disguise, finding locations. Is that Do I have it right? Yeah, we were shooting the fun of Rupert thing, and yep. um, it, was two, it was two. It was two vans. Yeah, two Dave, vans. Dave was in a separate van, and it, it was about it, it was nighttime. So that you I mean we shoot long hours on that skit. Yeah, and so you know we were driving around looking for the next uh, victim, <laughs> and and um, suddenly um, the 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 van in the front with Dave they pull over, so we all stop. And I was just wondering, why are we stopping here in the middle of nowhere? And apparently there was some discussion going on between, between the crew in, in Dave's van. And I later found out, and well, I heard from, from them talking yeah. that they were going to let me out to bother this person who was across the street. Well, I looked across, and lo and behold, it was Jay Leno who was interviewing someone else. He was doing probably jaywalking, right? Uh, I is that what he does? <clears throat> yeah, one of the bits that he uh, generously liberated from uh, Dave was mm -hmm. uh, man on the street stuff, mm -hmm. and and he renamed it jaywalking. At least that's my that's my kind of interpretation. It of it. Was, was, he, was, he was right, you know, at, at the crosswalk there, and, and, he, had and he had a microphone, and he was talking with someone. So they were debating, should we just send Rupert out and, you know, interact? Oh. And, you know, after, you know, five minutes of discussions, uh, they decided to, to just move on for whatever reason. But I, I you know, I, I think of that to this day and I wondered, you know, what would, you know, what would have happened? I think it would have been great if they tried it. I mean, you know, they can always edit it out anyway. Sure, well, and but they, it's a question that will never be answered because I would I would have loved to have fast talking Dave interact with them, you know, and um, it, and you know how they friendly on friendly terms how they cross blend once in a while, uh, late show host with late show host. Sure, that would have been like again another first for Dave because Dave was the trailblazer. I, I love what you said about he kind of borrowed, lifted, you know, man <laughs> on the street, because yeah. Dave, Dave is the one who started every trend, any trend and every trend. But wouldn't that have been something had he, oh, my word, how would yeah. it, and it would have been Dave. Well, and, and, and uh, um, I mean. Okay, so first off, Dave would say that he he uh, you know took the man on the street stuff from Steve Allen. That's the first thing Dave would say. But That's I true. believe you're right. I believe he reinvented it and reimagined it in ways that we would you know 
uh, that have cha right. changed comedy forever. Right. But the friendliness between late night hosts now is in direct response to the lack of friendliness between Dave and Jay. And the idea of Rupert getting out of that van and going over and having David Letterman in his earpiece being able to Thanks to it was, Leno. I, it would have been amazing. I do think. you think that do you think that Jay Leno, because you know full well that they probably both kept tabs on each other. Yes. You know, they're people, they're people. Do you think Jay Leno would have recognized Rupert for who he was? Instantly. I do. Uh, and I think that I would bet money that uh part of the consideration would be that Jay will audit will know exactly what's going on right away because um you know they they legendarily they would they would they would watch <clears throat> the 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 lore is or the legend is but it's it's in bill carter's books so they talk about this uh would be that leno would be watching yes and counting how many jokes would dave would be doing in the monologue and they would be they would really be meticulous about seeing what the other show was doing um and so i believe you know, my theory behind this would be that they didn't do it because it would have been instantly recognized. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's, I you know, that's, that's possible. Yeah. <clears throat> Rupert, when yeah. you were in your van, do you remember who would have been in the van with you? Uh, I would be with the sound crew. Yeah. Yeah. The, the people who would mic me up and get me ready for, for the shoot. The, 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 sound, the sound and video crew. Um, Sometimes they, you had Walter in the van with you, though, right? He was. Most of the times, Walter would be in the other van, I think. Okay. But he would have to go and have to get releases from people after That's the right. fact, right? Right. It, it was either Walter or Nancy or whoever was with us at the shooting at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in Dave's van, it would usually be the camera crew. Yeah. Because the camera is in that van. And the camera had and, to be on Dave, too. And of course, too. Dave, and if Robert Nett was around, it would be Robert Nett. Dave. Right. <laughs> But, you know, uh, when those bits are shown, there's a lot of Dave on a walkie-talkie. Yeah. You know, there's clips. So you've got to have cameramen both ways. On both sides. Yeah, and then the editors do their magic. And that's, that's I mean, right. as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, the unsung heroes of, of, yeah. of what the Letterman magic were the editors. Because, I mean, I think I think he pioneered those those quick edits where it would just go, you know, uh, you'd be saying something and instantly it would be going to the next Correct. thing or 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 that perfect shot of Dave on the walkie talkie Correct. talking to Rupert. They did such a good job editing those segments. Yeah. Um, that's a OK. So there's a good question. The famous one is the restaurant scene, uh, which I mean, those women at that table were so bothered. I can't even imagine whoever if it was Walter or whoever it was having to go over and get the release afterwards what that would have been like with those two. I think Walter was the one. Yeah. Was the Walter on that one? If I ever get him on here I gotta ask him about that. Like yeah. holy. They said no. They said no oh, for I, hours. It took a while to convince them to sign the release. It did. Uh, okay. See there you go. There's the question. Oh no. They were so pissed. We're talking. They, they did not. They did not want to sign. They just wanted to kill me. Actually. We're, we're talking hours. And then <laughs> and listen, Mike. They were invited back like a year later for some kind of fun with Rupert reunion show. No, no, what? no. They, they came. Oh, no, they came to the deli when they were going to show that segment. Oh, that's and, and oh, that's deli. really cool. Yeah, but um, they they still were not very happy. Oh, <laughs> I know the way even I even in the deli coming a year later they weren't happy. Really? No, no, oh. and the way I heard it is that they were audience members. Well, it wasn't that shot, night. It wasn't shot a year. I, it wasn't shown a year later. It was shown. Uh, I they think did a, a month later. A yeah, so they invited they invited the girls over. Oh, let's all right. Yeah. I gotcha. That that's very very funny to me. That's a really neat little PS to that story. I can I okay. I can kind of see why they might not have been enthused because, um, you know, there's footage of them best? showing them not necessarily in the best light. No. But yeah. that being said, who could blame them? I mean, the guy's putting the thumb in the water, and right. it's like I mean, but, but at the end know, of the day, that's probably what their hesitation was. I would yeah, think. but I couldn't blame them. I think they were spunky girls, and they wouldn't want they didn't want to take shit from me, and that's fine, you know. It's it's a natural reaction that they would do that. Yeah. They did it a little more harshly than maybe most. And I'll be honest with you. Had I been at that table, first of all, I wouldn't have been as glamorous as those girls because I thought at the time they were really 
you know, really hip, pretty girls. Sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But had I had that encounter and any of my family members were sitting at the table as that was happening, we would be under the table with laughter. Oh, we would be laughing at our waiter. Yes. Yes. But I think that that you're probably right. I, I agree. You know, here's a couple of uh, hip looking gals, whether they're New Yorkers or not, but they're out for a for a lunch on a patio like that kind of they're dressed up for it, that 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 kind of a thing, uh, which is the perfect, as Rupert says, victim. Um, yeah. To, yeah. Well, you know, we were very, very fortunate that, that that, you know, they were willing to interact with us because. I, I must have lost at least two or three sets of customers during the shoot. Oh. I mean, they were, I would just piss them off and they just walk away. This is a revelation <laughs> to oh, me. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, we lost a lot of customers. Did you hear it that? It wasn't easy. I did not realize that. Oh, that's, see, started. okay, I was going to ask that. That's that's another question, the release question. Then you had said earlier uh, how long some of these things take to shoot. Right. I was going to ask, at the restaurant there, like, would you have been there like for like four or five hours kind of a thing to get I, to get I that? A couple of hours, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't just the girls that I bothered. I mean, I, I was interacting with a number of, you know, victims and um, most of them just walked out. I mean, there was one where I think there was a party of four or five and they didn't tolerate me for more than a couple of seconds and they just walked out. <laughs> now, now they edit, they edit one of the, greatest segments of these two girls and I don't know exactly why but probably for sake of you know compression and getting a series called a compilation sure but at <laughs> one point in the early days when they were showing this Dave said I mean and of course it's all Dave everything's Dave Dave's wit everything yeah uh, Rupert sits down with these girls and says girls do you mind if i sit down a minute i have a lot of problems <laughs> mm -hmm. i've got a lot of problems now do you understand what i was trying to say is if i were with my friends or my family we would be laughing at ridiculing the guy who's standing right there, we'd be oh, yeah. ridiculing by our laughter. Like we would be looking and eyeballing each other, giving the side eye like, yeah, what's you, up with this guy? Are you believing <laughs> what you're hearing? Are you believing what you're seeing? And of course we'd be ridiculing him and he'd be standing right there, but we would be breathless from laughter, thinking what, an, what a weirdo is serving us at our table. Um, I, I, I'm the same way. Like, uh, yeah, like, 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 and I would, I, I'm the type of guy that would look at someone like that and actually start like going, Hey, what's going like, like what's going on? Like trying to pick the brain of that person. Um, and, and I'm, uh, did you ever have that? Did you ever have somebody like, like, like look at you quizzically and then start to start to ask questions back? Like study you? <laughs> no, like, are you no. okay? <laughs> No, no. I think a lot of them were intimidated. They just thought I was just a nutcase, you know. Um, but do you, look how many places he actually went. And yeah, we just have snips. They edited down to the, the very best. But how many places he infiltrated Yeah. and the reaction with that camera in his hat, the reaction of, oh, oh my. You know, well, that was actually you talk about the edits like I think about McDonald's. Oh, by the way, my buddy and I when when the McDonald's one originally aired, I believe it was the, the next time. day or two days later, we went to McDonald's and we asked for a pounder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we did like like this is, you know, me and Mike in the 90s, early 20s. Um, yeah. And, you know, we were kind of hooligans, too. And so we, we, we did that like the next day or two days later, we went to McDonald's and said, hey, can we can I have a pounder? And so what did, what did they do? They, did they throw well, you out? Okay. And this is to go to the other point that I was about to say with uh, what Irene just said, when the clever editing, when they would show uh, Rupert would be doing his thing and then it would just show a really quick shot from the hat's point of view of the clerk yeah. just looking at him going, yeah, like that, yeah. that's the look I got. Like, like, it, you know, we, we, we went there and I said, Hey, I'd like a couple of pounders, please. And they look at you. Okay, you know, but now, pounder, but he then wins. of course, what do you he mean? Explain a couple, it, but... 
he but he went into a couple of elegant uh places and i just know i mean going to the flagship ralph loren store as a shopper and you're at your best your hair is at your best your outfits at its best they would have escorted him out (laughs) in moments in moments okay let's go back to the restaurant though how stoked was the staff that rupert was here like the the other waiters and busboys and stuff like that they all must have been like oh my god rupert's here shooting a letterman bit no you know you know Business that was a, that's so, what that was such a new skit. I mean, I don't think the staff sta- the staff really knew who I was. At but first. they didn't mind you were there. They had no, an arrangement. No. Well, I had to go into the kitchen to get rubber gloves and everything. See, so. I always <laughs> marvel. I always marvel at that where he somehow has to let, and the staff ha- also has to say yes. Okay, you can shoot a skit in here. Yeah, it could kill my business. My business could fold tomorrow because of it. But yes, okay, you can film a skit in here. And I always marvel that so many people said, okay, or didn't immediately eject him. Of course. That's the power of Dave, though. Like, I mean, you know, you get one person who knows who David Letterman is, chances are they're a convert. Like that's the thing about Dave's enthusiasts is that they're very similar to Howard Stern. When you become a fan, when you're a, when you're a, a, an enthusiast or a fan of David Letterman, many times it's like, Oh, like it's, a, it's an enthusiastic um, yeah. yes. enthusiasm for him. Yes. So, but you yeah. see, I would do that in a second. If he came into my financial, my financial office, yeah. If, if, if a producer of, of, of Letterman's came into my financial office and said, Hey, we want to screw around with a bunch of people here. Can we, can we come in here? I'd be like, yep, absolutely. Yeah. And I wouldn't even think about what it would right. do to my business. I'd be just so excited about it. Okay. I guess. But again, he's talking about a new guy in town, although it may be a David been there a year or so. Yeah. He was an institution um, in New York still. Cause the late, yes, night, that's right? true. You and know? they still, yeah, absolutely. But the, how on that note, how hysterical it is since Dave and Regis are were fast friends from long ago. Yep. How hysterical it is. And I've been, I've been, I think I walked into the ABC uh, uh, studios one time and did a quick turnaround, you know, just to yep. go in yeah. and go out. But how hysterical it is to have a goofball come in and they don't immediately eject him, but <laughs> there is an understanding with the man upstairs yes. that yeah. you are going to be allowed to come up, but all the staff doesn't know, or the lady who totally. gets, the, gets the bouquet of flowers, take those flowers, take a flower over to her, and Rupert just grabbed the whole bouquet and gave yes. it to her. All these people, not knowing they're not in on the joke not in on the joke yeah Yeah. and you've got um you know security who is vigilant and has to be (laughs) careful about a quick ejection versus uh this poor guy he wandered in he's goofy okay he's gonna swim on that counter watch me and dave goes can you get up on the counter but oh, that's the, broadcast. The, <laughs> the hysteria of our being in on the joke and all these people being a little bit like, what do we do? And yep. then and then the call comes. Told you I was going to see Regis suckers. <laughs> well, OK, so what you're talking about, too, is 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 really, really cool because there's so many layers. That's the thing that's so genius. Um, like we just had Gabe Abelson on and he, he dissected a, uh, that's not even out yet, but it'll be out, uh, as of like tomorrow. Um, and he dissected a jo- a monologue joke, uh, that was, that had Dave doubled over in laughter. And, and it was so funny that they actually had the writer dissect the entire joke and it, it shows how many layers there were in this one funny, it was a Jerry Springer line and it was one line, but then the layers of why that line was funny. So uh, we talked about it. Your sketch um, that that you would do, your ongoing sketch that you would do for Dave, had layers to it, and and I think we've talked about a couple of them here. Like like one of them was exactly what you're talking about: the boss of an establishment 
maybe being in on something that was going on, but the staff members not, right? right? Then there's mm -hmm. the customer. So there's then all that aspect, that aspect of it. Then there's one other aspect of it. I believe that part of the humor of what you guys did was Dave getting a kick out of making Rupert go and solve a problem of some sort, like <laughs> go get rubber gloves or go, you know, go, he, go swim on the table. Like he had a task for you that you kind of had to figure your way to getting done. And that's a layer of humor too, because you, he's also, you, you know, seeing what you could you do hear? and you had the chops for it. You did it for decades. Did yeah. you hear? But it, only, it, it only worked because I mean, Dave is just so genius. fast. Yeah. He's yeah. just he's so a fast genius. Thinking, so spontaneous. But did you and hear first, Dave go like this to Rupert? Rupert and, and Rupert in typical style goes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you think you can go in the kitchen and find some gloves? Okay. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly it right there. The little conversations that they would have where he would go and make Rupert problem solve. And it was, you're right, Rupert. It's his razor sharp wit thinking on many levels, yeah. you know, interacting with the people, but also interacting with the environment, also having a little side conversation with you at the same time. Right. But calm. Well, remote, calm. like he's in a van. But calm, <laughs> mild mannered. Uh huh. You think you can go get some gloves? Uh, okay. You know, uh-huh. I just thought that was great. Now, the, uh, there's a, another element going into an establishment where the manager, the restaurant with you skinny son of a bitch, um, oh, that with, 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 that, with that waiter and the managers, forget the melon ranchers who are sitting over at this other table. I'm going to buy those melon ranchers their lunch. I remember all this stuff. I've seen him. Oh, he doesn't remember. And I, the I fruit stand, the fruit, the fruit stand. stand. Wow. Yeah. I that just watch it one. over and over again, but a manager coming out right away and trying to talk about problem solve, sure. trying to get this man from not disturbing my restaurant. And this is a manager who's unaware. Yep. You know, I mean, Oh, was that, was that the time when I pulled the tablecloth? Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And 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 the, another time when, well, I thought Mayor McCheese was oh god. Uh, ex, I thought he was extremely diplomatic with Rupert. You know, <laughs> you can't be bothering the customers. What's it to you? What's it to you? It just it was hysterical. It's Dave. But but I study these skits now visually. Rupert's timing and his facial expressions, I, I would put him in a category of good acting. Oh, well, of no. course, but but I the thing so. is, it's, it's, it's improv though. It's good improv. It's just you and your delivery, like your delivery is unflappable. Yeah. Like, 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 <laughs> just say, how you doing you son of a bitch? Like the way that you would say son of a bitch even is just, it's it's funny. It's it's not expressionless. It has expression to it, but yeah. it's just so unique. And you seem so unflappable about things. You're a huge Jets fan. When you're watching the Jets, and they go down, they return for a touchdown, or so they come back, or something like that. Like, are you are you the guy that gets animated, or are you do you just yes. kind of smile I, about I, it? No, I get when it comes to football, I get animated. He's animated, <laughs> but but Mike, nobody in the van told him to go like this. Boom. Oh, Boom. yeah. See, with a golf club. Nobody told Rupert oh. to do that. And that to me is good acting. It's instinct. Because, because he could have just said, boom, boom, but he picks up his hands and pantomimes, boom, <laughs> boom. I, I, I look at it frequently and I, he's really, Rupert's really good at the responsiveness and Dave, Rupert can tell you, Dave did not want Rupert to say, what did you say? Can you say that again? Uh, oh, Rupert, so the hearing was really important, not a, yeah. Oh, the, no, very, yeah. yeah. And, and, and quite often we had problems with the feed. You know, okay. You know, because you're shooting out in the streets, so there's a lot of interference. Yeah. And so, you know, I spent a lot, most of my time just concentrating on what yeah. Dave has to say. Yeah. yeah. Rupert that makes said sense. That, um, I asked him how many times did he actually ask Dave to repeat himself? Because I know Dave would not be a fan of that. 
And, yeah, well, um, you don't want to interrupt the flow of what's happening, right? Yeah. But he said, he said maybe only a couple times, he goes, I concentrated very hard. Yeah, on what I can, I can was. imagine that's a huge part of it. But Which just is. like the under your breath stuff to Dave too, like so far, Dave, yeah. um, I don't have any money. Okay. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> he told me, I asked him, I needed the ending of that story. And he said, uh, the girls in the van, somebody, a girl in the van, in the van came and supplied the, the money that needed to go because i always want to know what's the end what happened me too after? oh me that's that's where you and i bond irene um you know we want to know the story behind the story behind the story like we want to yeah. know all of that stuff and we're fascinated by it they paid um, for it the, yeah the, somebody in the van came up with the money and paid the, paid the bill that's the thing that's where that's where i get curious about this stuff dave's uh famous uh, for being such a good interviewer because of his natural curiosity. He's so curious about that. My curiosity about this stuff, like I want to know who's in the van with Rupert. I want to know who's like how the, the, the mechanics of the whole thing worked. And I'm endlessly fascinated by it all. So well, um, you, you heard something I've never heard before. What's that? Which is, which is there were many uh, participants who stopped being participants pretty damn quickly. Yeah, Meaning well, I, I can imagine. I, I can imagine there were a lot of people who were like, nope, not doing this today. <laughs> and they just turn I, around. I, and... I thought they were successful on every oh, on a, every on outing. Interaction yeah. you know, with every person? Yeah. Oh, no. As oh, a matter of right. fact, I, I dare say the success rate was prob probably 10 or 20% at most. Wow. I mean, you know, we're, we're shooting out there for hours at a clip. I, I'd say that first time we shot, we, we were shooting for eight hours. Yep. Uh, we were all, all right, how around many, for eight hours. How, how many skits did you pull out of No, it? no. How many minutes do you pull, get out yeah. of it? All right, how many? And no, no, I want interactions. Oh, no. I just said it's a, it's a 10 to 20% success rate. Most people would ignore you. Or, or it would turn into nothing. But... Yep. Um, for example, we would shoot for eight hours, and I think we're lucky if we get two to three minutes worth showing. Yeah. And Dave, uh, famously, we talked about this with with some of the folks. Um, it might have been Tommy Ruprecht, actually. He talks about how they would shoot these remotes that were hilarious, mm -hmm. and they'd be like four and a half minutes long. And the That's whole right. thing was good. And Dave would be like, no, let's trim it down to two and a half or three. Like, like he loved good economy on things. And, and I think... I mean, I, again, we talk yeah. on this show too a lot about the stuff that ends up on the cutting room floor. The cutting room floor of your stuff must be laced with hilarity. Like, I can't even imagine the stuff that, uh, you know, was, oh yeah, it's almost good enough, but not quite, which is still Yeah, Are you kidding? Oh, Mike, <laughs> Mike, Mike, get real a second. I need you to get real. All right. They're saying you're proposing to him to imagine how many bits and pieces of his uh, whatever ended up, hilarity ended up on the cutting room floor. Yes. And he did not perceive that the stuff that got put on was hilarity. So you're talking okay. to a person who's like, I don't know. Yes, but that's part of Rupert's charm, in my opinion, Rupert. That's part of your charm is that you you just you don't see what the big deal is, right. um, which is part of what you bring to the to the equation. And and again, that's the the irony. And of, if, if Dave isn't anything, you know, ironic is one of the the mainstays of all of Dave's stuff. Um, mm. You know, that's an ironic element that's added to it. It's, um, you know, and I mean, we're not going to mention any names or anything like that, but there were some folks who, well, you know, we can mention, you know, Manny the Hippie. Well, why didn't Manny the Hippie last three decades? You know, and it's 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 because uh, there are many people who wanted to get the spotlight. They wanted to leverage. They wanted to turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. I think, Rupert, one of your things is that you just stayed you the entire time, whether cameras were on you or whether it was a staff member ordering a bowl of soup in the in the deli. You're just <laughs> you. Um, I would submit he, that that uh, you just he would not know what jewels were on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Please. Please. You know, well, we've talked about this too. Some of the celebrities who've come into the to the to the deli 
where and it's not like celebrities should be treated any differently but sometimes when you run into somebody who is like yeah you know all, uber famous it, it trips you up a little bit it didn't matter who was coming into the deli you treated everybody no. the exact same like, right. like and he didn't know well he okay did. okay talking dead the kid hardwick chris hardwick, chris hardwick like yeah. that. okay my sister-in-law she gets because she knows everybody from walking dead personally she's a, a groupie yeah um, so she gets super excited one day and she says irene irene you've got to look at youtube um uh talking dead whatever the whatever the thing was he shot he shot that, a selfie with me in the background okay so <laughs> i so i look at it I look at it and I thought, I, no idea I thought that was so pleasant. And I said, thank you for sharing this. So immediately after work, I said, Rupert, you are on the walking dead. Uh, Talking dead. You know, you are on walking dead thing today. Yeah. He posted it on Facebook, I think. It doesn't matter. It was under the banner of walking dead. Oh. And, <laughs> I, and I, and he said, you two cracked what, me up, by the way. He said, what? And I said, the guy, the guy who does Talking Dead, he goes, I don't know what Talking Dead is or Walking Dead. What are you talking about? I said, you took a picture with him today. He said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. And I said, okay, well, then let me just send you this. He had zilch idea. Do you know how many times that happens? You already know the... Uh, Rolling Stones one. So, okay, oh, I know yeah. that story, but nobody else knows that story. Rolling Stones, what? <laughs> Rolling Stones? Okay, yeah, what look at, look at question mark. Rolling Stones? So, a guy comes in for coffee, and um, later on, the guy comes back in for coffee. Oh. Okay, so Rupert's customer, Rupert's no, customer. No, a kid comes when he he orders a cup of coffee, he's a really skinny guy, scrawny, yeah, scrawny, and he orders coffee. He leaves, and then this other kid from outside he comes in and he he asks me, "Was that Mick Jagger?" I no, I don't know. It could have been <laughs> look alike. I have no idea. It was exactly. <laughs> I, I I would not. Mike, I would not swear that it's Mick Jagger. Mike, I, it was. Yes. It fits exactly the time frame. Oh yeah. Rolling Stones were doing their gig at Late Show. Okay, that's oh, absolutely. But again, what we're do, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the appeal, like and and showing the appeal of Rupert, though. And I that's that's the same in 2015 when I talk about my story. You know, uh, that my my uh, night that changed my life. Uh, you know, seeing him a month the day before a month he retired before he retired, going and seeing Rupert beforehand before we got our picture behind the desk before we had that really cool exchange. I had that exchange with Rupert and I was just as stoked and excited about that because Rupert made me feel like I was the same on the same level as one of these celebrities. Cause I am with you. Like, like that's, that's the beautiful thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, so many people want to come in and they're so excited to see you and take selfies with you and hear you tell the same story over and over and over again. Like <laughs> I, I've said, you must be one of, one of the most, especially from New Yorkers, you must be the most patient New Yorker there is because you get the same questions from people for decades. Do you know what he told me one time? And I want you to answer. What he told me one time, he came to the hotel after work and he just was being again in his casual conversation, not knowing that I would be sparked by just the littlest of w w weirdness that he says. <laughs> and he goes, I said, how was today? Uh, how was work today? He goes, it was good. It was busy. I'm really tired of smiling. Oh, I, my, he goes, my mouth. Yeah. The, the cheeks the, probably hurting. Cheeks. I can imagine. Because my cheeks hurt. Uh, why? Because I was smiling all day. Yeah. Like, uh, you were just going to say something about coming after work and smiling. The same, the same question over and over and over again. You were, uh, you oh, know. Yeah, yeah. I felt like a broken record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about May? Because that, that's something that I'm really curious about too. Because May was shown on camera, I would say sparsely. I would throw that out right. there. You know, I mean, she was there, but um, and I think part of part of the appeal too was the mystery as well. They didn't know ever if May was one of your employees or if you guys were right. connected, or they people didn't know. Right. 
They and I, I, I'm certain, well. yeah, people would have thought that. Um, you know, was did did May ever get sick of, of 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 all the attention, or was it always just no? We're business partners. This is really good for business. Yeah, no, she always enjoyed it because it was good for business. So, but so, but um, you know, I did, I just got lucky because in the beginning, May was still running the garment side of the business. Yes, and and so she was not always at the deli, and I was handling the deli most of the time. And so when the camera came in, I, I just happened to be happened to be there but now um, if, later if, on if it i mean if may was working she probably would, would have been the star uh, you know? I, <laughs> may's got a different disposition and they did kind of they kind they dave mentions may he oh, sure. always he's polite mentioned, he's mentioned oh, yeah. he's always polite yeah. and friendly with may Absolutely. but i i do believe that the selection was extremely careful about this cartoon here and he doesn't well, I, yeah I, I think i think you're right i think if, if if rupert was on the garment side and may was the one doing the day-to-day -day oper operations of the deli um i don't think may would have ended up in a van uh no. with they no, flying across yeah. the country and all that kind of stuff but yeah. i do think yeah. that yeah. That, that, that you know th there would have been something there it just would have evolved different very differently right um you know i think that would that would be the case i uh um, one day, like this is, this is going to be a great podcast, by the way, but this is kind of more the unofficial one. If ever we do sit down, Rupert, and talk about the idea, you know, where you came from and all of that stuff, because I love that story too. Um, but there is one element that I, I, I just, if we never do this again, I, I you know, I, I want to get this out there. Like you talk about serendipity. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, you know, because Dave moved over in 93 was when all that that kind of stuff happened. But it was 91 that you got the store, right? Right. So like mm -hmm. and and you you had been in business and you were uh, you you always had the idea of having a soup and sandwich shop. And and, and you like the idea of that model. It, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but the way mm -hmm. that I the way that I, I remember it um, like, OK, <clears throat> Ed Sullivan Theater at that point, there was no inkling of anything happening with that theater um yeah how did you guys end up with that location and i mean in your wildest right. dreams you never would have thought what happened in 93 would have happened uh, mm -hmm. but how did you end up at that location well you know back then we were full time into the garment trade yeah and but you know it, it was it was always my dream because you know ever since i was a kid i love sandwiches i dreamed of sandwiches for you know and so one day, you know, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be nice if I can just play around with a deli? To me, it's a dream come true. And so I told May, you know, why don't we just look for something to just bat around with, you know? And so we picked up the Times. And back then there was no internet. So we picked yeah, up the yeah. New York Times and we found this one, sh one shop that was for sale. And so we, we, we drove over to have a look at it. And I, I fell in love with it immediately. It was not very big. It had a good frontage to it. Yep. And at that time, I didn't even know it was part of the Ed Sullivan Theater. Oh, but really? Yeah. So, but apparently this guy was going belly up anyway, cause he, he was not running it properly. And so I said, you know, May, let's just give him, a, um, give him an offer and, and see what happens. Cause I said, I, I think I could turn it around. And so, you know, we, we literally bought it from him for 30 grand. So, so, you know, I thought it was going to be a part, you know, uh, just a part-time gig, you know, yep. and I would fix it up and flip it. So the, you know, I, I, it was, to me, it was a dream come true for the first two years I ran it on my, you know, with a crew and by myself and, um, who would have known two years later that they yeah. would move into the neighborhood and that just changed the whole you know outcome yeah. of yeah. Me running Delhi. it became a full-time endeavor well and, and, and it turned into a blessing massive massive that, that that we're still talking about that's you're still running like i mean you're on vacation from it right now yeah, down I'm in florida running. you're still running you're still there yeah, it's it's been 30 years 30 years um when Okay, so you're there, you're getting your feet under you, you know, in 91, that kind of a thing. When mm -hmm. do you start to hear rumblings that there might be doing something with the theater? Oh, yeah, well, uh, within a few weeks of the show. 
And, and um, I remember by then I got to know a lot of the writers, right. uh, including Rob Burnett. And, but when I, when I first heard that they were visiting, you know, taking turns visiting the neighborhood, yeah, that freaked me out because I, again, as you know, I, I just did not feel comfortable being on television. I did not like being in front of an audience and it, I was really getting very nervous. And so I told the writers, you know, you guys can just go visit the other neighbors. You don't have yeah. to visit me because I'm definitely afraid of being on. And, and of course, Robin Nett said, okay, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. But anyway, you know, it was inevitable, it happened. And um, yeah, who, who, would, who would have known? You didn't know after the copier, you thought they were gonna stay at the copy machine place. Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. That night, I, 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 I heard that they were going to visit the copy machine center. Right. And, and so when I heard that, I breathed a sigh of relief because I said, oh, they're not coming over. But then what? This is the meet the neighbor why. segment. Right. Yeah. And what happened was, Dave instead of just down. sticking with the copy center, Dave said, let's go around the corner. And then I almost freaked out. I almost fainted. <laughs> um and, and and i mean you know one other footnote that i just want to throw out there uh because again that's how my nerdy brain works um the 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 reinvention um and the renovation of that theater was oh, nothing yeah. short of amazing you must have gotten just a boom from the construction workers you must have got a boom in business while they were doing the renovation oh, of the theater it was, it was crazy uh, when we first moved in the the building was in such bad shape i mean yeah. you believe it rats in the basement um it, it was just horrible yep and um yeah it, it was just a wreck and of course you know the, and it, it was a big undertaking because it, it was a landmark yeah. and so they had to make sure that the, that the original sure. fixtures were were there and yep. they, they couldn't yeah and they couldn't do, do a lot of changes they just had to restore what was there and so i mean yeah, business business literally tripled. With the, yeah, the well, they showing the montage of all the workers in there, mm -hmm. and, and I can imagine you know a very high percentage of them if they're going to get a coffee or a lunch or whatever, they're just going to the deli attached to the like. Oh yeah, oh it was nonstop. It was nonstop. Yeah, from breakfast to lunch, it was just nonstop. Speaking of landmark, um, actually, this is good that we're getting this out of the way too, because uh, earlier this year. You mm -hmm. became a landmark. The uh, Hello Deli became a landmark, right? Yeah. Well, we we, we you know, Hello Deli is part of the Ed Sullivan Theater. Sure, but there was yeah. a ceremony this year that was focusing on you guys, wasn't there? Oh yes, it was uh, uh, the mayor's. What was it? A mayor's proclamation uh, yeah. to celebrate yeah. our thirty years uh, serving the people of New York. Paul came down. Paul came, yeah. It was it was it, it was really flattering that Paul that showed up, so nice. uh, along with Bill Chef, Pat Farmer, and Brian Tedda, and Brian Tedda who who was who was the executive producer of the View. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're trying it to get Brian really, on the show. Brian, I keep going back and forth. I'm going to try. We're trying to get him. Uh, it's oh, really? A of no, scheduling. he's a great, great guy. He's he's in the big leagues now, and I'm so absolutely. Happy him. Yeah. Um, and our friend Don Giller was there as well. Of course, he was down there for that that event as well. Um, That's right, Don Giller, and, yeah. and a number of other people. I yeah, it, it, I mean, I it's amazing. Something. Yeah. I want to add something. At the time, and I'm very sad, and I haven't been back because of all the things that have happened to me, um, and COVID. But um, Roseland, you had said on our previous podcast with yeah. me, yeah, um, you had said about configuration. Now, this is before, even before um, our friend um, David K came on the scene. Yes. They, oh, yeah. You and I are going to definitely talk since the David, because you've watched the David K episode. Wasn't that a fantastic it, episode? <laughs> it was more than fantastic. And it put a lot of pieces of the puzzle together for me as an yeah. audience member, always seeing David Kay, he said, yes, he would be in the theater if he wasn't remote, but I saw him frequently. And now- He had it down to a science. He did. Oh, he sure did. 
Yeah. Yeah. And Rupert has not seen so much of the David K podcast. So I started watching it. He started watching yeah. it, but I put a like on it. Okay. But the thing we appreciate is appreciate it. Like, share, subscribe, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I wanted to tell you is that crazy configuration stuff started even before David Kay. And the time that I went in for lobster bisque to try to escape the cold, by the time they had us lined up, and again, I had to be first in line. You see, it, it was important. So I got... The, I got the person who acknowledged that I was first in line to let me sneak off and get some lobster biz because for the warmth. Well, by the time lineup started. This would have been like 95, 96? 95, 96. Yeah. Um, when lineup started, I was really frustrated because they took the entire line. And this is not just once, but this was the first, my first experience. And he had a role to play in this later. They took us over to Roseland that they had access to. And it was just an, a beautiful, smelled like old, old beer and dancing, you know, <laughs> dance hall. It was just wonderful, but it was old. Yeah. And they took us and configured us into at least 12 funky lines and my party had not arrived remember i was the designated driver yeah. and i had told them specifically about what it says about arrival and lineup yeah. and they were all floating around new york uh, neighborhoods close by but not there yeah and yeah. they put us in these lines that made me feel like i was no longer the flipping first person there. Yeah, and it wasn't nearly as organized back then. It was, no, no, no. It was highly organized, highly organized to not let you really know what's up. Oh, they, I see. Okay, so it was they confusing. Did not, and, yeah. They did not want any audience member really to know what's up. This is before my fair, I met my fairy godmother who asked me about the people in front of me. This is before that. Yeah. And, but I was frustrated because I was put in a line. I was first in that line, but it, we had like 12 different funky crisscross type of lines with a lot of people monitoring us, yeah. young yeah. folks that I now know were interns, pages, whoever they were but later not that time and of course my people arrived late and they were going to put my people in some funky remote area not with me and oh. yes yeah and so I went up to the doorway when I saw them told the person behind me at a, a great risk, mind you, because you, when they line you up in these lines, you're not supposed to be casual and, you know, no. have freedom. Yeah. But my people arrived in the doorway. And the first thing I did was I said, I hate you. I hate you. And I hate you because they messed up the whole dang thing. And the tall, tall, lanky uh, intern slash page said, looks down because he's very tall, looks down at them and says, I think, I guess you could say she hates you. And so <laughs> I so I said, please, they're my party. Can they can they be with me? The answer was no. And then wow. what happened? The answer was no. And that's like when those, David Kay would talk about how people would like it'd be years before they'd hear back or or you know they they spent all this money to go there and then the experience like wasn't you're you're basically showing and i mean we're not trying to uh, you know we're not trying to bury anybody here talking about this the no. reason they brought david in was because they had problems like this and the momentum uh -huh. of the show was that of a freight train it was just this massive massive thing it was, and, and, it, and they brought him in because of things like what you're talking about here it, it was very well controlled but chaotic. it needed to be streamlined yeah and it was chaotic yeah so Again, I was very fearful of losing my place 
in this lineup that seemed so odd. And then my people come and the answer is no, they yeah. cannot stand with you. Okay. And my girlfriend made a big mistake. We're from out of state. We're all here to see the late show together, but we can't sit here together, even though you have acknowledged like, like that's, that's yeah. Yeah. And that's some growing pains that need to be fixed for sure. My, my girlfriend made a huge mistake. She was put in some obscure crisscross line. Yep. Away from the other two in my party who were placed elsewhere. And my girlfriend, who's kind of like me, um, we are we speak up. She gets out of her line. I can see her at a distance yep. in this Roseland ballroom. She gets out of line and she uh, um approaches the girl who's managing my line yeah and this girl was not an intern or a page she was an employee and i know that because of her strong authority yeah and my girlfriend goes like this i'll give you 20 dollars if you let me stand next to my friend and this is the answer now you're really pissing me off if you don't get back into the line where you were, you're going to be asked to leave. Yeah. And I was petrified. And she was kind of too, not, not as much as I was. And she had to return to her obscure place. But eventually, they softened and we were all allowed to be together. But we got the first, well, there were four of us. Yeah. And we, we got the first three seats. I got that one that's right, right in front of Dave's desk. Hmm. And that's when the script fell. And I handed it to a tall, lanky guy that I came to know as Pat Farmer. A script for the evening. Is that the first time you met Pat? Y yes. But Aww. there was no formal introductions. I met him eventually through Rupert, but I had talked to him uh, uh, frequently outside yeah. of the theater because by then he was starting to get, sorry, hold on. Um, Do you remember who was he, on the show that night? Yeah, oh yeah, we had a lecture. Oh no, no, we had, a, we had a stern lecture and it was somebody got up on the stage at the uh, Roseland and said, tonight, is a controversial show. Every person is entitled to his or her opinion, but we expect for you to be respectful of both. Now, my first experience was Al Gore <laughs> and, wait a minute, not Al Gore, who's the other one? Who's the one who has the uh, problem with his arm? The pin, he had a problem with his arm. He's Are you talking there. about Bob Dole? Bob Dole, sorry. Wow. Okay, hold on. Bob Dole and Marilyn Manson. Okay. Holy Those smokes. Okay, so there's a one-two punch. You want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, both ends of the of the spectrum here. Correct. Um, Bob Dole and Marilyn Manson. That was your first, that, that was your, that wasn't your first one. Very first one. Holy and, smokes, Irene. And, what a show. And that's why we got this, this lecture. But irony of ironies. That hey, I, I'm also going to throw something out there just to the, you know, to the staff that night. Perhaps that's why the staff, when it came to the lineups and things like that, were a little bit more on alert. Uh, that might that might be it. You know, we've got, I don't yes. know if he would have been a senator, maybe a president. I think he was, a, no, he was a senator at that he time. He was a senator I'm at that sure. point. Yeah. Uh, but it isn't, it isn't exactly that way, simply because I lined up at Roseland maybe three or four more times. Now, yeah. not, uh, that night was more strict than the other two times lining up at Roseland. Yeah. But because of the controversial of the guests, yeah. but the musician 
if I'm not mistaken, my very first time in addition, because Marilyn Manson was hawking a book. He d- was not performing. He didn't perform, yeah, yeah. No, he was. And when I finished watching the whole show, I said, this is a very smart young man who's uh, doing publicity for his book. And again, yes. 1995, where it's pre-internet and even pre-cell phone, uh, you know, widespread use of cell phones. Sure. But this kid was there to promote a book. And if I'm not mistaken, and it is in our yearbook, um, I don't know which, per- yes, I'm not sure which performance um, exactly is in our yearbook, but all night, and I'm almost positive it was this very first time I ever went, all night long was the wonderful young man who plays with Blues Traveler. John and Popper. He yeah, was. Yeah, he was on the show a lot. I love. I love to have. Yeah. I, I yeah, to have and I show. and I could be. It, it could have been my second show because he had his band uh, at one time. You know, at one point, but that he himself played with Paul Schaefer. Yep. All night long, and if you want to talk about an experience and a half, now oh, yeah. back back to the inclusion of Rupert, who's coming. Well, hold on. Right he was also now. John Popper was also uh, with the band uh, that week in San Francisco that we were talking about as well. Yes. He was also there. But for I, that. and I didn't realize that. And I, when I look in the yearbook, I'm trying to remember. If it was, you know, when I was there or not, all I know is it made, I, I, I didn't know who Blues Traveler was really. I'm not, yeah. I'm being yeah. honest with you, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it made such an impression on me that I was over the moon with, with pleasure uh, because the music, I didn't realize we were really in a sound studio. Now back to Roseland, Rupert was the provider of hot cocoa to 461 people in Roseland. The so that is that is that the first time you met Rupert? No, I didn't okay, know. Okay, you had met I him did. before. Okay. Yeah, no, and I don't think Rupert was the actual deliverer. Right. Um, he just made the cho- chocolate. Oh, he said he here. he said he was. So it wasn't my very first um, appearance or my very first participation in the audience that. Um, the, the hot chocolate was provided us. Um, but additional times when I went, it it was provided by Rupert. And he said he was the actual dispenser of the hot <laughs> cocoa. And I don't recall it. I don't recall it. But I did want to tell you about, come on back. He's checking his phone messages. Okay. I want I um <laughs> I did want to tell you that the wild configurations started before David K got there um and it uh, and I only could surmise that they really didn't want people to get a clear grasp of where they were going to be how they were going to you know it was right. that part of that breaking you down building you back up business yeah. and but what was kind of cool was I retained my first seat position and the three in my party were let out of jail <laughs> and were allowed were allowed to accompany me as person two, three, and four. So it, I, that made me happy because you know why? Because I was there at 11 a.m. and yeah. I froze, I froze. And that's this lobster bisque thing going in and all that. Okay. So but that's funny though. That's the 11 AM. Like you think about that um, and how it, it's still, there are shows that are still like that where they, where they, you know, you got to, you're basically, you're donating your entire day sometimes Always. just for the chance to see the show. My Always. first time that I saw the show live, it was in 05. Uh, Jim Carrey was the guest. Uh, mm. I can't wait. I, Pat and I keep going back and forth. I want to tell him the story. Pat Farmer yelled at me at that episode, um, not not outside of the the, the theater. Um, and you know he he 
obviously mm-hmm. wouldn't remember or whatever, but I was standing on a dumpster because I wanted to see Jim Carrey. Um, and he told me to, to, to get off the dumpster, which I was, I was more <laughs> delighted by Pat Farmer saying, uh-huh. Hey, get off that dumpster uh-huh. uh, than I was seeing Jim Carrey. Like I was just yeah. so delighted by that. But, but going into the theater when I, the first time I went in 05, I remember it being like watch like precision. You know, I never saw that, that, that chaos. It was very, you know, you, they were like, no, 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 don't show up until, until three. They didn't want you to. They didn't want you there at that point. And by, you know, and then, and then even the week, um, the last, the last month, you know, I was there for April 20th. You were there for the last one. Um, even that was fairly organized. Um, it is, you know, so it just shows the mark of what David K did. And again, it's one of the, we've had so many people reach out to us, thanking us for the David K episode, uh, you know, because it explained a lot of stuff. Oh, and I mean, all, all the pieces of the puzzle started yeah. to come together. And I thought, you know, because I have so many stories to tell you, but David K um, would clap his hands when the music would start along with his interns and pages who were posted where they were supposed to be. Kind of leading the enthusiasm, leading the-, the Well, yeah. he, this is the irony. David Kay is a kind of a very rigid, straight-laced kind of guy. He's, yes. a, he's, a, he's a scientist. Yeah. So, but when you are an audience member, because this same first trip that I- the first legitimate ticket that I used to get in, um, I had asked outside. I have a pair of theater binoculars. Um, would it be okay? And actually, you know what? I'm messing up here because I said that that was the first appearance being lined up in Roseland. That is incorrect. My, but the first time that I went, it was, anyway, now it's horrible how I'm getting things kind of confused between the first and the second time, but. The I fact a, that you have seen the show so many times that they all blur together and these details blur together is astounding, I never by the way, Irene. Many people would down. envy that, being able to say that, because, I mean, you've saw it so many times. I want to know about the theater binoculars. What did they say about that? Did they okay, let you them? so I'm I'm outside, and I'm yeah. already sufficiently scared, and this is pre-David Gay, and, that, and it leads to David Gay. So I'm already sufficiently scared simply because of the rigid lineup and yeah. all this, and uh, I at that time, when you showed up at 11, um, there were enough people to not do that. There were people like me who did that. And then eventually the numbers started to grow yeah. and, they sh- and they shoved us away. Yeah. And I would just walk around the block and come right back. Yeah, I, It was very difficult to make me leave. And they said, we can't block the streets. When people started to congregate, the streets cannot be blocked. So that's where I sat on that fire hydrant, which was not comfortable. But you know, I, I was, t- I was tucked out of the way. I was tucked out of the way, and I squatted on the fire hydrant, and that was a great place to be because I was right there. My but, dad used to punish me by telling me to go sit on a fire hydrant. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's not, it's not comfortable. So I'm just kidding, Dad. He, I my asked, dad didn't do that. <laughs> so I asked. I said, I had a ja- I had a blazer on, and I said, "May I, may I?" Not having been in the theater, that's why, that that's why this story is important, and and why I was wrong when I said the four of us in the party that was our first time. No, Marilyn Manson and Bob Dole were the guests at, on that time. Okay, and our and our configuration in the Roseland and our speech being made about everyone's entitled. To John his Giller will history check this probably anyway. So if we get any okay. dates or guests wrong or whatever, okay. which happens well, all the time, happens to writers. Oh. They 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 swear like like Steve Weiner said that uh, uh, Don Giller is his actual memory, and yeah. he's the guy that contradicts the thing that that goes on yeah. in his head because he's got it all lined well, up. I know. Anyway, for, I know for a fact about Bob Dole and Marilyn Manson and the lecture and getting lined up in yeah. uh, Roseland. Know that very clearly. Sure, sure, sure. It's the time. 
it it was my very first time not having been in the theater right but still insisting you know my mom's got that in her like I'm going to be the first one there and that's that <laughs> and you all about that. and everybody <laughs> behind me better know that I'm first yeah okay but I still had an air of kind of uh, you know I wanted to behave simply because they foster that air of you better behave yeah oh yeah so I asked politely I said I've got theater binoculars am I allowed to have them and they said looked at him and said sure why not he uh, I was a young man who said the stage is so close not really quite sure why you want them <laughs> but if you want to <laughs> take them okay I'm thinking it's a theater sure um, even though I did sneak in and tell my principal that it was small when the audience was leaving, I did sneak in and I said the audience was small. Uh, okay, so I'm on that, again, I'm at that seat. Yep. You know that seat. Yeah. Unobstructed, yeah. right in front of Dave's desk. How much closer would you want to actually be? And I pulled the binoculars out. I pull the binoculars out at that seat and I have- Do you have an illegal dog fighting ring going on in the other room? Yeah, because, <laughs> okay. because a dog next door barked and mine is protecting the household. Well uh -huh. done. He's a peanut, okay? <laughs> He's a peanut. Okay, so anyway, um, I, pull, I pull the binoculars out. Within. You want to see what kind of shoes Eddie Brill is wearing? No, I wanted to look up <laughs> Dave's left nostril. I aye, wanted aye, to aye. see the nostril hairs of Dave. That's what I was thinking to myself that that I could see, <laughs> I could see him that closely if I just have these binoculars. There were three people on me in a micro. Oh wow microsecond and yeah. i i took them away from my eyes i tilted them to show that they were binoculars it's not a camera yeah yeah or something else i don't know so i never the thought of a camera never dawned on me if yeah. they I, I the way they swooped on me you would have thought that i had a machete <laughs> and so um, as soon as they saw that they were binoculars, they backed up. They didn't yep. turn around and walk away. They, they paced backward. But truly, Mike, how ridiculous having that seat. And you just took a glance at your photograph. Yeah. So you, you know the proximity. Yeah, you were sitting where Oregon. That's the other guy who the night I asked my question, no, Oregon no. was the other guy. You were no. right near where Oregon was. No, darling, I wasn't. No. Go go to the extreme right of your row. If you're on the front row, yeah. Go go to the extreme right where Dave's desk is. Yeah. There's only three chairs. There's only three seats. And you are right at Dave's desk. Yeah. You have no box that rolls in front of you and you have no human being standing in front of you. How many that times did you sit in that seat? I want to let you guys go because I know Rupert's on vacation right now and I, I, I love hanging with you guys. But um, okay. um, uh, uh, so I want to be very cognizant of your time too. Um, and by the way, for saying that we couldn't do a podcast episode, we've done an entire episode, by the way, right. just, yeah, just to let you know. Apparently. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> You tricked me. Yeah. Yeah. Not even a little bit. We're just we're just playing. Um, yeah, how many times Mike, did you sit in that seat, Irene? Mike, well, I'll tell you, but Mike, <laughs> you and I both knew the outcome. If I could just get Rupert to sit down next to me, you and I both knew what would happen. But he, um, hold on a second. Let me call you back. I'm doing a podcast. Okay, I'll call you right back. Okay, so anyway. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> and it's my daughter. And it's my daughter. Okay, so. <laughs> and it's my daughter. All right, so so um, 
Okay, what were we talking? Oh, how many no, times? How many did times did you sit in that seat? I would say more than four. ten. No, I would say I only got that seat for maybe five times. And don't forget. I w and I'm really itching to tell you how I went from just yearning at the sawhorses to finally getting into that theater. But um, later, I would say 2006, 2007, um, I was again surprised beyond be beyond where I got a, a visit in line and the velvet rope came up and said have you ever been to a rehearsal and i said i said no <laughs> and from that point because then that involves jennifer yeah. ray yeah. whom uh david k said he couldn't do without yep um and again that solves some pieces of the puzzle for me about her but anyway I was treated by my fairy godmother to a rehearsal with Marianne Faithful, and oh. it just was, it was delightful. Yeah. The band is amazing, really. Oh, the, oh. I, I, yeah. I, I said this to Will, and I've, I've been going back and forth with Felicia um, a little bit, and, and, and I said, I, you know, when, if and when, you know, if we get the stamp and and we can do some really cool, bigger things, I want to do a separate podcast about the music of Letterman, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and call it live on Letterman, just like they used to call it. Like, like I, because the band itself, like Will and I, we did over 90 minutes and we were, we didn't even scratch the surface right. of anecdotes and memories and things about the music That's on right. the show. Um, like you talk about the rehearsals when bands would do extra songs just for the audience, oh. that kind of a thing. Marianne oh, Faithful. Right. That is seeing her rehearsal like that, that. That's, that's amazing that you got a chance. For one to see hour, that. one hour. Um, Christy, my principal and I, I want to say, who's the one who's saying American Pie? Not John, was John it John Mayer. Mayer? John Mayer, yeah. For one hour. He, that night, was it that night? No, no. Different night, okay. This is a different night, because I you asked me about how many times I got to sit in that, sit in that prized seat. Yeah. But, but for one hour, when we were allowed to be seated, as soon as we checked in, we watched John Mayer. We were his only audience. He played to us. He knew we were watching him rehearse and he rehearsed for one hour and it was not just American Pie. You name it, you name it, we heard it and it was a private concert. Yeah, now, that's... oh my gosh, oh my gosh. What, talk about vibrating inside you. All right, yeah. so at the end of this magical thing that I didn't know was coming, uh, getting a a couple of CBS pencils, also getting to see some family photographs. Yep, yes, yes, sirree, Bob. The late show. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know I was going to get those, and also I did not know that I was going to get to see some family photos, and that meant my fairy godmothers and others. Yeah. Other photographs. Yeah. And. Then she asks me, do you, do you want to sit upstairs or do you want to sit down here? And I pointed to the magic seat. To your seat, yeah. I said, do you mind if I sit right there? <laughs> and she said, no, not at all. Now, that conversation was separate from the audience's uh, coordinator's knowledge right and thank goodness my fairy godmother was still present when i took that prize seat and was approached by a theater coordinator yeah who didn't audience, know? they wouldn't know they're just doing their thing an, yeah. uh, an audience coordinator who immediately instructed me otherwise yep and i said but and I was about to say my fairy godmother's name, Ooh. but my fairy godmother uh, said, I could, oh, 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 okay. All right. 
oh, oh, all right. But you have to be an enthusiastic audience member. <laughs> I said, no yeah, need. Yeah, no problem to, there. No need to tell me that. Rupert, has there ever been a problem with Irene's enthusiasm? Oh, no, never. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever. <laughs> no, no. And so my wife would say the same thing about me, by the way. <laughs> no, for sure. You, but I was also, I was also asked not to participate in audience Q and a, since I was technically a guest of CBS and yeah. it was reserved for those, as I told you, the people from Nebraska who really did everything they were supposed to do yeah. and, you know, try to get that ticket the way. And I wasn't doing that anymore. I wasn't doing that anymore. Now I'm going to close out for me yeah. by, by saying, and I would, I just am getting over being very sick, but I'm going to close out by saying, I cannot wait to tell you the transition of a desperate fan, me, dragging her family at five o'clock to the <laughs> sawhorses just to catch a glimpse. And we got great photographs, Paul Newman and all the string of celebrities I told you about. Wow. Yeah. Going from that point, thinking that's the best you're going to get, because I did call the theater and they said, sometimes it's years before tickets are, are sent. Mm -hmm. And so I was deflated in 1993, 94. I was deflated yep. with that, with that knowledge. So I thought the best I'm ever going to get is just to sit at the stage, stand at the stage door, be there first. You know, the guests don't usually come out till 530 unless one's, you know, and be there first. Yep. And then we get to see them whisked off. And for two years, at least four times a year, least, we were doing that. And that's what I thought was going to be my whole late show life. Hmm. And then things changed. But Well, just kind of like when Rupert bought the, uh, the little sandwich shop yep. in this old derelict theater that, you know, really had a, you know, he got a great deal on it. Little did he know that suddenly yep. this would become... Uh, once again, lit up with the yep. uh, with the celebration yep. of show business yep. the way that it has. Uh, but, just like yourself, like I mean, hey, I've collected a lot of cool late <clears throat> show stuff. Uh, I think you take the cake for all the things that you have collected because you collected Rupert T along the way as well. <laughs> I did, I did, but I do want to ask you, and I'll do it on yeah. air, and you decide how you uh, leave it in or not. Sure. Um, it, it, would I be I mean, the statute of limitations you said has expired. Okay. So my days at the sawhorses looking at celebrities yep. to actually going and getting in that sacred line and getting in that sacred hallowed theater, it, it involved, you know, behavior that the statute of limitations is over now so can i you're gonna it? have to finish this thought because people are going to be making assumptions so what are you talking about what kind of behavior yeah. are we talking about irene rupert's <laughs> looking what's going on okay you know you you know how you know how i got you do know how i got in correctly yep correct well it was as david k said snail mail yep and you know what I did, correct? Yes. What did I do, Mike? With the postcards of how many different addresses that you sent in from and all of the- you And got, how, I, how I warned every family member yeah. that if an envelope should come that well, has- You weren't alone in doing that. There were lots of people back then who were so hell-bent on seeing the show that if they sent their little request in from their house, they didn't feel it was enough to get them in. And so they would send from their brother or their sister or whatever. You took it to a different level. You, you, sent, you went. <laughs> I sent eight postcards yeah. in different penmanship, different penmanship. Yep. It's it expressly, the letter expressly asked you not to do that. Yes. And, and additionally, back then, 
the the talk about David Kay's wanting to pin pin you down to you know this is a real thing. Yeah. Um, every sixteen tickets, and every ticket had a date. Yep. And I would have had to go eight times in a row because the dates were October 10th, 11th, 12th. I mean, yeah, you hit the mother load. You hit the mother load. And this is again, pre David K, right? Like that's the stuff that he came to organize. This is, this is a really good companion episode to his episode actually. Well, that's why I, I, one of the things that he needed to organize and figure out. Immediately I got excited because I did correspond with a girl named Janice. Yeah. And, um, you know, because I had 16 tickets, I couldn't go eight days in a row. And so they were gracious enough to let me spread those tickets out. And then at that point, we ran out of tickets. And for some odd reason, I had one legit ticket left, gave it to my sister and Christy and I had to vie for the standby tickets and got bumped but it was a year, one year almost to the date that I had met my fairy godmother who was an intern. She was at that time, the year before was an intern, the year after, and we were bumped. And I was like a little bratty kid on the curb (laughs) because we didn't get in. And and my sister said, "I, I know he was gonna come to me for know your cuts of meat and immediately because I got nauseous she said and put my head down uh and like you do in class you stand, put your <laughs> hand over your forehead like this to the signaling to the teacher don't call on me and my sister was enjoying the show we were out on the curb and here comes my fairy godmother walking that and that's the rest is history so uh, the statute of limitations has indeed, uh, has indeed, of course, expired. Um, you know, people have asked, I've actually had people ask me, uh, how did she see the show 40, 48 times, 40, 40, how many times? How did she, how did she do that? And so you've kind of uh, shed some light on that. And I appreciate that very, very much you doing that. I, I love you guys so much. I'm, I'm, you've taken time out of Rupert's vacation to do this with me. I appreciate that like crazy. Oh, um, no I want to finish with Rupert because you are the sponsor of the Letterman podcast right there there it is oh nice for the Yay! audio for the audio folks uh i'm i'm I've, I've opened up my jacket and i'm showing that i'm wearing my rupert hello deli t-shirt um by the way rupert Kelowna, british columbia canada um i get i get comments on this shirt all the time people oh hey rupert right on that's awesome that you have that when did, you know it's it's, really? it's it's very cool so uh obviously if you want to get Late Show merchandise, Late Show with David Letterman merchandise, uh, go to hello-deli.com. If you're in the New York area, go to the Ed Sullivan Theater. Check out the sweetest soup and sandwich shop that you'll ever see um, right at the stage doors of the Ed Sullivan Theater on 53rd Street. Um, uh, Rupert, the fact that it's so beautiful to me, it's one of my favorite things about this show is that you, I get to say every single show, we have one sponsor. That sponsor is the Hello Deli. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for being you. Um, it's my pleasure, Mike, really. God, uh, man, in my 20s, going and ordering a pounder because of something you said on TV <laughs> the night before. Like, I, you know, I, it's, you can't, you can't, you know, I know it just kind of oozes out of me how much, how grateful I am. But um, I, that's where I want to finish with you really quick. I don't want to, you know, ne- necessarily get into the the heartfelt, all the, this sort of stuff. One thing about you, I remember you saying it in 05 when I met you the very first time. And I remember you saying the same word when I met you in uh, 2015. And you've used it many times in our conversations uh, since. And this is a cool kind of way to finish off this episode. Um you use the word blessed. You've used that word a lot and, and, and how blessed you have been. And I know you've expressed many sentiments to me. Um, and I just want to throw this out there. How grateful and how blessed are you to David Letterman? 
Oh, forever grateful. I mean, you can't quantify it. I mean, it's not just the money part of it. It's the emotions, uh, you know, the whole interaction, the memories. I mean, it's it's priceless. You really can't put a number on it. And he didn't watch the episodes where <laughs> Dave said, you'll meet the nicest guy in town if you go around the corner and get a cup of coffee. Dave, uh, Rupert never saw those episodes. <laughs> and we, you and I did. Oh, yeah. You and I saw how loving he was to him. And he, uh, Rupert's blood. I, I love that. I love that at, at, at dinner. We the, we experience this, this at dinner. When you and I get going, Irene, I love when Rupert looks over and go, how do you guys remember that? Like, because he, yeah. he, he never bought his own hype. He never bought your own hype. But at the uh -uh. same time, and so you never watched the show in that regard. Um, I mean, obviously you've seen things and things like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't the same. And I think mm -hmm. part of that gratefulness is just the fact that like, that makes the gratefulness that you feel even more special because it wasn't about the notoriety on TV, even a little bit. It was just, it was about he this relationship yep. and, and, and I know how grateful you are for that. And I will tell you this other thing, Rupert, hopefully this is a gift for you. Mm -hmm. I have talked to some of them on air already. We've done 40 something episodes, uh, but many folks that I've talked to off the air that haven't been on the show yet, or maybe might be coming on the show, that kind of a thing. And uh -huh. when I mention your name, um, no, two things. Number one, instant credibility for me. So thank you for that. I appreciate that very, very much. But uh -huh. second, the people who worked for that show adore you. And I'm certain you know mm -hmm. that because you have this relationship with them. And in many ways, you were you know, they're, you, you not only fed them, but you were their counselor he or you, you were their that. ear that when they needed it, or you Rupert, were just this, I, it was the, the affection it. for you mm -hmm. from these people that I've talked to, again, you can't really quantify it. So I just want to let you know that. And I think you do know that in your heart already, but I'm just telling you that as well, Rupert. Rupert well, would you. not thank understand you. that word, but he did say something very special. It was mutual. Um, oh it, yeah, no, no. The feelings were always mutual with all the all of those people. It really yeah. was. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful for this. Hopefully, this isn't the last time we do this uh, for this show. But this is very special to me. Thank you so much. Um, I that that that's it. You know what? I'm oh. just going to end it right now. That's another episode of the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, my name is Mike Chisholm. Uh, that's Irene Hoffman. That's Rupert G, the legend, the man, the myth, the legend, Rupert G. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, and good night. Always a pleasure, Mike. <laughs> Overcoat and underpants. <laughs>